Welcome back to Monday Musings, a casual conversation about culture and theology. I'm Justin Ely. And I'm Daniel Chen. We're just a couple guys talking about some stuff. The stuff we've been talking about are Christian clubs or Christian denominations. Hope you've been enjoying the series. Uh, Today we're going to talk about Lutheranism, which neither of us know much about. Yeah, which is funny because I guess this was the start of how we even got here, you know? was like Luther, you know? Right. Hey, thanks, Martin. (laughs) So, yeah, I feel like, you know, I felt like growing up, the Baptists had a big church, the Methodists had a big church. Yep. And then I knew a couple of, like, scattered Presbyterians. Yeah, you think about— a lot of Lutherans. Yeah, you think about First Baptist, First Methodist, First Presbyterian. Yeah. And then it's like, are there other denominations? Yes, there are. They're Lutherans. Yes. We're going to talk about them from last time. And Anglicans. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, did you grow up knowing any Lutherans or anything? There was a Lutheran church, like, down the street uh, from where I lived, and that was literally all I knew about them. I was like, oh, they have a building down the street. <laughs> I didn't know any Lutherans. Yeah. I, yeah. I mm. guess there's just, like, a smaller contingent in this area. Yeah. But now, it, I wonder if you're in different parts of the U.S., you'll have different— Yeah, like— uh, People from, like, Minnesota, seems like a bunch of Lutherans there. Huh. They're all Lutherans. Yeah. So, so yeah. So we're going to talk about Lutherans today. But before we do, we're going to talk about our book of the month. Daniel, what's yours? My book of the month is How to Win Friends and Influence People by book Dale. Book of the Century. Yes, by Dale Connery. I mean, it was written, like, 1930s. Yeah, almost 100 years ago now. I love this book. Yeah, so it is... I mean, it is what it is. It says, like, how to win friends and influence people. And like anything else, like, the biggest critique is, like, this teaches you how to manipulate people. It's like, no, this just teaches you how to, like, interact with people yeah. and, and have influence over them. And the manipulation thing, by the way, this is a side tangent, it, drives, like, drives me nuts because, like, I mean, how are you defining those words? How do you define the difference between influence and manipulate? Sure. I would say some of it has to do with, like, the reason I'm doing – trying to influence sure. you i do believe manipulation exists it's just i think too often people throw out the word manipulation when it's not actually manipulation and then yeah. it waters down the people who are actually manipulating people right? yeah for so, sure but anyways this is probably the like foundational book you should read if you want to learn how to win friends and influence people it's, I've read it it's at amazing. least three times already. I'll probably read it. I read it about once every three years so I can pick up something new and try to implement it into my life. Um, it you, just, you have to read it. Yeah. If you're a leader of anything, which you are of something, uh, you you got to read it. Yeah, Be- it's best, so good. It's like the most foundational leadership book you could ever read. Yeah, yeah. So uh, super good book. What about yours? My book, I'm reading it right now. It's John Adams by David McCullough. So a couple funny things here. One, when I was a kid, uh, my grandmother, specifically on, on my mom's mom, like loved U.S. history and wanted me to really like care about my heritage. And I was like, this is boring. I don't want to talk to you about this. And she had, the, I remember she had this John Adams book and she talked about it. And I'm like, that looks very boring and very long <laughs> to me. And here I am now. She's passed for many years but uh, now I'm finally reading the book so David McCullough is a great is it, good? it is David McCullough is a great American history writer and his book on John Adams is uh, he the one that wrote the one about Hamilton that spawned Hamilton no that's, that's I think Rod Chernow okay which I also want to read but uh, yeah I mean really good book interesting take on John Adams only thing that's upset me so far that I didn't know did you know I uh, I'll just tell you right now. I Probably don't, not. <laughs> but tell me anyways, yeah. Did you know that uh, on July 4th, 1776, only two people signed the Declaration of Independence? Really? The uh, president of the Congress, which was John Hancock, and the, like, recording secretary. Mr. Hamburger. <laughs> no, I'm just the, the, the rest of them, it took another month to get the, like, official thing, like, printed up all nice. Huh. They signed, most of them signed it on August 2nd. Interesting. They, it's July second was really the date where they they really agreed this is going to happen. So John Adams thought July second would be more of the date memorialized. July fourth, they oh, you like mean August second. No, no, Ju- July second they agreed on it. July fourth they signed the rough draft. Oh, interesting. Two of them. And then August second, most of them signed the document, but not all of them. It trickled down until January of 1777 when the last person signed the declaration. Wow. 
It kind of bothers me. Because January is a terrible time to celebrate July 4th. Yeah, you can't, you can't celebrate <laughs> July 4th in January. Uh, then that messes up the age of America. All these things. Yeah, that's super confusing. But uh, really good book. So if you're, if you're a history person, uh, John Adams by David McCullough. Also, this is just like revealing a general truth about life, which is like everyone's just making stuff up as they go along. Yeah, you know what, what the I mean? heck? It's like July 4th is just like... Yeah, we're gonna sh- gonna decide to say this, even though the last person who signed was January. Like, when do you count it? Like, who decides those metrics? Someone did, right? And now that's what we do. Yes, like that's all of life. <laughs> yes, and ap- apparently they like agreed to pass the declaration like before lunch, and then they moved on with other business. Like that was it. That Thomas Jefferson went shopping the afternoon of July Fourth. Just another day, <laughs> committing treason against the king. You know, uh, it's like I might as well shop now because I'm going to get you know hung. Uh, and the whole like Benjamin Franklin, either we hang alone or we hang together. Apparently, we don't know if he actually said that. So all these things, but it's a good book. Man, isn't Besides it interesting how your tastes for things change over yeah, time? It is. So um, my grandmother would be very happy. But yeah, John Adams, give it a try. So today we're continuing our uh, series on Christian clubs by talking about Lutheranism. Again, we're using Trevin Wax's Quick Guide to Christian Denominations on the Gospel Coalition. But just getting started, Lutheran started as a negative title for those criticizing Martin Luther's teaching. It's kind of like the Methodists, right? That happened to you. Yeah, and I I guess Christian, right? Like that was like a derogatory term. Um, I'm glad he didn't come up with the name for himself. That would be a little prideful. Prideful. It'd be like in Exodus when it says that Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. Right. Yeah, for for, for all the people holding to Moses writing the Pentateuch, and I'm one of them, uh, hopefully not that part. Yes. <laughs> because man, it does occur after he died. That's a whole other of how Moses wrote the Pentateuch, but there were other people who like filled in things. At least that part. Yeah. You so. would think, unless, like, right before he died, God's like, you're about to die. Write this down. I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, and then God's like, you were the most humble person. Write it down. <laughs> I don't want to. Just write it down. It's, <laughs> it's true. It, okay. It, you're proving my point. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so that, and for those you don't know, it's actually in the Bible. Like, it is It does there. say that. Look yeah. it up. Uh, so history of Lutheranism, uh, it started with uh, Martin Luther who taught in Wittenberg, Germany, not to be confused with Wittenberg, Germany, with a W, because I've done that and looked like an idiot before. Uh, In the early 1500s, um, he is the one who started the Protestant Reformation by nailing the 95 Theses to the um, door of the Wittenberg Church, which apparently we also don't know if that happened. Really? If he actually nailed it there. Like, he stapled it? He may have just, like— Publish them. Oh, really? I'm like that. Really messes up the drama there. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna just like my July Fourth thing. I'm gonna kind of zone that out and just believe he nailed it to the wall because that's a better story. Um, and he really, we've talked about this before. He wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church. He didn't want to leave it. Right. Um, he later was excommunicated uh, because of his teaching. And you will see that in Lutheranism that it's like a lot of the, you know traditions in the church are much more similar than sure. most Protestant churches. Sure. And it's because they, they he didn't want to reform. Uh, he didn't want to create a new yeah. church. He wanted to reform it to, right. back to its biblical roots. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So f- Philip, I, I struggle saying his last name, Melanchthon? M- 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 Melanchthon. 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 San Diegoites. San Diego on. It's M E L A N C H T H O N. So you don't. Philip think I'm in... Melanchthon. Yeah. Uh, took his teachings uh, in Germany and expanded them into Sweden, Denmark, and Norway. And Lutheranism spread to America initially through Swedish immigrants in the 17th century. So that's kind of the the history there. And yeah. I do think it depends, like where a lot of those immigrants landed in America, right. tends to be where Lutheranism is stronger. So uh, makes probably sense. in Georgia, there was just never a large Swedish population. Population. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I think uh, something interesting here, too, that I don't know, as, as I re- you know read the history and stuff, that it, it almost seems like like when I was growing up that Luther was this like single figure doing this. But even like finding out about Philip Melanchthon and yep. really, I mean, there was other theologians just kind of 
in Europe that followed soon after that were had the similar thoughts. Sure. So it wasn't like Luther was like single handedly leading this charge. Like, yeah. you know, there was many people who believed in sola scriptura. Sure. And um, but Luther was kind of like the the, the ignition that kind of lighted the fire right. of, of all this. Yep. So yeah, yeah. He uh, he was a very fiery guy, uh, for better and for worse. Uh, so what is the church like? Uh, they tend to be more liturgical than a lot of other Protestant denominations. Like you said, if, you, if you've been raised like non-denom or Baptist and you go to a Lutheran church, you're going to freak out and think you're in a Catholic church. Right. Uh, yes, absolutely. And then you're going to be like, wait, this is the guy that started the Protestant Reformation? I'm very confused. <laughs> right. um, so it's going to feel pretty liturgical. The pastor is going to be wearing vestments leading a set order of worship i've only attended one lutheran service i think yeah i think i've attended a few in my life but it's been a while um so th- there's going to be confessions absolution offertory sermon homily recitation of a creed usually an Nicene creed and other prayers so pretty pretty liturgical um as far as polity they're more episcopal right than um than some and more congregational as well. So they kind of combine Episcopal and congregational as far as government goes. Yeah, so that's interesting. I think like, uh, like Baptists are congregational, totally congregational. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think it's like in the middle. Like I think they have some like district superintendents, but I'm not sure they have power to like move pastors like the Methodist do. Yeah, I could be wrong, but uh, yeah. So a few different distinctives. So if you're Swedish, let's know. Yeah, yeah if you're a <laughs> Swedish Lutheran, you know. Um, a few different distinctives. Um, justification by faith alone is obviously a strong doctrine uh, of Lutheranism, as it is of Protestantism, but coming from Luther. Uh, Book of Concord contains the historic confessions of the Lutheran tradition. Um, and you're going to see a large emphasis, and this is what Luther emphasized, reading Scripture with a law-gospel distinction, right? So it's, it's kind of something is either law or either gospel. So the law condemns the conscience by showing that you're unable to keep its demands, and the gospel consoles the conscience through the promise of forgiveness through Christ. So they're going to see that as very, it's one or the other, hmm. law or gospel, um, as far as Lord's Supper, they're going to emphasize the real presence of Christ at the Lord's Supper. So not transubstantiation, um, but also a little more than, like, the Presbyterians on, like, the spiritual presence view. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. That we read in our pastor's fellowship The Care of Souls by Harold Sankbell last year, who's a Lutheran pastor. And it was interesting— to, to read him, and he talked a lot more about the like the Lord's Supper as like a sacrament, a means of grace. Yeah. Like he talked about when he's going to visit the sick, he administers the Eucharist to them. Like that's a big part of what they do. Yeah. Um, and they use the term Eucharist. And, I think so, yeah. yeah. That, that would make sense. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's more of a, again, real presence view. Yeah. Um, so something there. Luther developed the two kingdoms doctrine. This is a really important way of, like, how do, how do Christians interact with society? So two kingdoms says that God ordained two kingdoms on earth, the temporal and the spiritual. Uh, the temporal is guided by the civil magistrates, right? Mm-hmm. That's the government. And the spiritual is guided by the word of God. It's the church. And God rules the whole world, but he rules them in two different spheres, Interesting. So how you interact with culture, you know, as a Lutheran, an, an over-application of this is you totally separate your faith from everything else. Right. Our faith is in this kingdom. Everything else is in this kingdom. Yeah. I'm not saying it's that's how Gnostic. all Lutherans do if, that, if, but it's if you an take it over-application. Yeah. yeah. Um, so famous figures, we got Martin Luther, Philip. Melanchthon. Melanchthon. Gosh, I just can't do it. <laughs> um, I don't know any of these other guys. Philip Jacob Spiner, but it's Jacob with a K. Weird name. Like J A K 
K O B, not like K A. Come on, Mister and Mrs. Spiner. What are you? What are you thinking? <laughs> what are you doing to your son here? I guess that's that's probably how you spell it if you're Swedish. Or I something. remember just yeah. probably a Swedish thing. Yeah. And Harold Sankbell, that's the person. I, if you're a pastor, you should read The Care of Souls. It's a, it's a really good book, and it'll challenge you from a, a kind of more Lutheran perspective. Um, so a few different groups, main denomination of Lutherans in America, the Lutheran Church of the Missouri Synod, or is it Synod? See, again, all these Lutheran terms, I don't know. I don't know. Synod? synod? I've, I've heard Synod. Synod? So I've ne- heard neither synod. of what I said. Yeah. Um... Once again, I'm not I'm not the words guy here. Yeah, yeah. So well, apparently, neither am I. Uh, <laughs> the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Don't be surprised by the title, though. Uh, the ELCA is hardly what I would call evangelical. So they tend to be the the most liberal group. So I, my understanding is the Missouri Synod is a pretty like. Orthodox conservative gotcha. group of Lutherans and the evangelical Lutherans. My understanding is they're going to be in a very different place on like human sexuality, yeah, inerrancy of scripture, those kind of things, right? So, uh, very different kind of vibe going on there, yeah. I, and I think w- what you see that's interesting is like with all these denominations you have these subgroups that are like very different from each other For so sure. if you ever go to one it's actually kind of important to know like what what kind of yep lutheran church am i going to what kind of presbyterian church methodist church yes. what kind of church am i going to you know yeah it, it's it <clears throat> you you can kind of lump all lutherans together in a, in the sense of some of the similarities but they're going to be very different on authority of scripture, human sexuality, based on which subgroup you're going yeah. to. So it is important that you no. look things up and know before you go. Yeah, I think the other thing that, that's interesting to me about Lutherans uh, is that, you know, I feel like a lot of the stuff that we, we just said is that they kind of are in the middle ground of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. And so that... You they don't, have, like, neatly fit your stereotype of Catholic or Protestant. Yes, yes. Y- exactly. And another one, I think, is that, like, most Lutherans are, like, not full Calvinists, right? But they're not Arminians either. Yeah, they, they don't... Uh, they're not going to fit neatly in your Calvinism box either. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, like, would agree with, like, three or four of the points, and that's, what like, what they teach. I don't even know if they would, like, acknowledge the, the points, points at all. Yeah. Like, I, th- I think it's, like... Like, like a lot of Baptists are like, yeah, I'm a three-point Calvinist or I'm a four-point Calvinist or whatever. Um, but I think they're like, what do you – no, we're Lutheran. Right. Like I, th- I think it's literally like, how many points of Calvinism do you agree with? Like, I'm Lutheran. I'm Lutheran, yeah. I yeah. believe in the Lutheran belief on right. soteriology. Right. Yeah. And I think that's how uh, like communion is too and baptism. So it's yep. infant baptism – and but like and it's it's it's, it's like almost baptismal regeneration, regeneration but it's like not but, but it not. is yes yeah because they would say like what is it baptism is a visual word like baptism is a visual word from god and that god through his spirit through the water of the spirit births us anew yeah and so there's like some some degree of like regenerative power in the waters of baptism right um but it's not but But it's it it doesn't save it doesn't like it's not like clearing (laughs) original sin like the catholic belief right but it is but it does like save you but not in the way that we mean save you know what i mean like it's so funny yes but like i know that sounds so confusing but but it is like hey we're using different definitions than you are yeah we're our language that we're speaking is a little bit different here and so i do think it's important like when when you're talking to other christian groups and you're trying to like understand each other's beliefs like just understand that words mean different things to different people. So, like, define your terms, right? You know? And yeah, the, the the baptism is like not baptismal regeneration, but kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think what you're seeing with Lutherism in in both the sacraments, it's like that meme that's like, yeah, but also no, <laughs> <laughs> no, it it is. I think in both the sacraments, um, yeah, it's it's a little more mysterious. 
th- they're going to hold to it a little bit deeper of a mystery, Myst- yeah, than I think a typical so. American evangelical. Which you know, like, I'm not saying I agree with the Lutherans, but I think that principle of holding to the mystery of God is something that Americans hate. Yes, I, hates a strong word that Americans don't like. Yeah, we, we want to know everything. Mm-hmm. I think they're okay. Like, it seems like Lutherans are okay with living with that mystery a little yeah. bit more. Which I, you know, I don't know if I agree with their conclusions, but you know, because I'm a Baptist, sure. But, uh, but I, I do love that heart towards the Lord, that disposition towards the Lord. Ah, for sure. Yeah. Um, any stereotypes about Lutheran? I got. I guess. Swedish. Finnish? They're Vikings fans, apparently, or you know, something. Uh, I a lot of Hillary's. Um, Hillary's mom's side are Norwegian. And so uh, we went to visit some of her, like, extended cousins or whatever a few years ago, and they're all, like, Lutherans, you know, in Norway, you yeah. know. And so I guess that's a stereotype, <laughs> Swedish or Norwegian. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just – I guess I don't know enough Lutherans to have a stereotype about them. Yeah. So no stereotypes. At least down in, like – Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. I guess the stereotype is like, wh- why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't you be up north? <laughs> yeah. Is it too warm for you down yeah. here? <laughs> so that's Lutheran. As you see, I mean, this has been our shortest one. We just, here, here you go. That's, that's all we got yeah. on Lutherans. So uh, we hope you are enjoying our series, Christian Clubs. Yep. And we hope, you know, if you're Lutheran, give us a shout. Yeah, uh, send us, us an know. email. Yeah, maybe the stereotype is like you're quiet and you're like hidden. You know what? That's probably true. <laughs> make yourself known. Yeah, make yourself known, Lutherans. We'd love to hear from you. But uh, we'll be back in a couple weeks continuing our series on Christian clubs, and we look forward to talking to you then. <laughs> <laughs>